Yes, I've been to the doctor. Yes, I'm on antibiotics. Yes, it seems to be getting worse. You know what I got? What have I got, Dean? I got the epizootic. That's what we used to call it back in Ohio. Anyway, in order to try to keep it here and not spread it, after services, I will not go back and not that I don't want to shake your hand, I just don't want you to get it. <coughs> one of the greatest feelings, one of the greatest feelings in the world is when you're finally able to make that last payment. I once saw a joke in Reader's Digest, oh, it's been years ago, this fellow had borrowed money from the bank in order to buy a house. And for years and years, he'd been making monthly payments on his home. Finally, the day came when that last final payment was due. And so he wrote the check, and he was getting ready to put it in the envelope. He decided he'd write a letter. And so he wrote a letter to the bank. And in that letter, he said, I want to thank you for the loan that you gave me so I could get this house. I want to thank you for the 30 years that you've put up with me sending payments in to the bank so the home can be mine. This is the final payment. And he signed it respectfully, but no longer yours. You know, it is great when we send in that last car payment or house payment or, or at our age, that last payment on the hospital bill that we owe. Because whenever we send that last payment in, we know the debt has been paid in full. And we no longer owe money to the car company or to the bank or to the hospital. The Bible gives examples of debts which have been paid in full. This morning, I want us to consider some of these wonderful examples that have been given from the mind of God for us to read, even yet today. I couldn't help but think, paying a debt is certainly biblical. Making a debt and not paying it is against every principle that God has given. We read in the book of Romans, chapter 13, verses 7 and 8, the apostle writes to the Christians at Rome, and he says, Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to who custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. This passage begins with the Apostle Paul telling Christians at Rome to render therefore to everybody their dues. You know what he's really saying? What he's really saying in that very first verse, Paul is saying... Pay what you owe others. That's what he's saying. Pay your debts. And the only thing a Christian should owe is to love one another. And then I, then I couldn't help but think, why is it that sometimes people aren't able to, to pay? And I came to the conclusion that very often we try to live above our means. We do. We see what other people have, and we decide, i got to have one of them. But we can't afford it. But we get it anyway. In this world of so much, many people find it hard to live contentedly with what they have. And so the Apostle Paul writes, and he says in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 8, he says, but godliness, <coughs> 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 
But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Now, Paul in this chapter has been writing about false teachers. And you might wonder, well, what is it that false teachers has to do with anything that he's just said? Well, Paul goes on, and he starts out talking about false teachers, and then he tells why there are false teachers out there. And Paul says that one of the main reasons that there are false teachers is because them guys are teaching for this right here. They're not teaching to please God. They're not teaching the word. They're tickling your ear so that you will financially take care of them. And so it is with that idea in mind that Paul goes right into what he says here. He says these folks that are doing that think that money is going to bring them contentment. So Paul tells where real contentment does come from. Contentment has nothing to do with how much you have. Contentment is that which is found in the heart of man. Being contented in whatever your lot in life is, Paul says that <coughs> that's great gain. And it is indeed great gain to learn to be content without worldly treasures. Majority of you remember our dear sister Ivy Crumb. Precious soul. Ivy didn't have a whole lot as far as what a lot of folks consider to be necessities she didn't have. But I always remember one day Margaret and I were visiting with her, and before we left, she told us, she said, I've got a roof over my head. I've got food to eat. What more could I she was content. Paul reminds us all that we brought nothing into this world, and the things of this world are just temporary. They're only meant for this life. Job said in Job 1.21, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. <laughs> when we arrived on the scene, we didn't bring anything with us. When we leave, we're not going to have anything physical to take with us either. And that's why Paul ended up the passage by writing, Having food and raiment, let us <coughs> therewith, excuse me, let us be therewith content. <coughs> Having food to eat, a roof over our head, clothes to wear, that's really all we need. Anything more than this is just an added blessing, and we ought to be receiving it with thanksgiving. <coughs> <coughs> Getting back to the idea of paying our debts, one more thing. The psalmist wrote in Psalms 37, 21, he said, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. Well, when we think about payments and debts, we've got to consider what our precious Lord said in the book of Matthew chapter 18. To introduce what the Lord said there, <coughs> we're going to first go back to the Old Testament book of Amos. And one of the ideas given in the book of Amos has to do with God punishing those who have sinned against him. Now, according to Amos chapter 1, verses 3 through 13, it appears that the prophet is saying, that God has been willing to forgive certain people for three transgressions, but then on that fourth one, God will punish them. And if you look through those verses, you'll see where people would get that idea. The cities and areas of land that Amos included that God was going to punish were Damascus in Syria, Gaza over next to the Mediterranean, Tyrus up in the northern... <coughs> northern part of the Mediterranean, Edom and Adam, Ammon, as a result of what they had read now in the book of Amos, the rabbis, <coughs> including those who lived in the days of Jesus, began to teach that the Jews had to forgive people 
three times. But if they got sinned against or trespassed against or transgressed against a fourth time, then you didn't have to forgive anybody. Now, that's what, that's what the rabbis were teaching in the days of Jesus. You had to forgive three times, but you didn't have to forgive any more than that. They, they got that idea from the book of Amos. <coughs> Jesus is now in the city village of Capernaum on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. The apostle Peter speaks up and asks the Lord a question. You, you remember Peter. Peter was the one that often shot from the lips. He was quick to speak when he should have been silent. Perhaps in this case, Peter was trying to show the Lord how righteous Peter thought that Peter was. But he asked Jesus a question, and the question that he asked him is found in Matthew 18, 21 and 22. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Now, Peter, having been raised a Jew, was well aware of the teachings of the rabbis concerning forgiveness. And he knew that the rabbis taught three times you had to forgive, but after that you didn't. So he comes to Jesus, and blowing his own horn, it sounds like, more than doubles this number of three, and goes all the way up to seven. Peter seems to think highly of himself, or maybe he's trying to get the Lord to think highly of him. Well, Jesus does tell Peter exactly what he thinks of this statement of Peter, because he says to Peter in Matthew 18, 22, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now, the Lord is not suggesting that everybody keep a log book. And whenever somebody does something amiss to us, we mark it down in the book. And whenever that person finally gets to where he has trespassed, transgressed, sinned against us 491 times, that we don't have to forgive him. What the Lord is saying is forgiveness should have no end. In order to emphasize this, Jesus tells Peter and the other apostles a parable. He says that there was a king, and this king began to try to find out how much money was owed to him. And so he began to have people from his kingdom brought in, and the books would be opened, and he could say, well, this one owes me so much, and that one owes me so much, and that one, and he's trying to collect. And the Bible says that there was an individual brought before the king who owed the king 10,000 talents. Now, a talent was a weight in gold or a weight in silver. If it would have been a weight in gold, one talent of gold in today's money would be worth about $1,116,000. So this fellow who was brought before the king, Jesus says, owed the king $11,160,000,000. And an insurmountable debt. An unpayable debt. A debt that an individual would never, ever be able to pay in many lifetimes. He owed a debt he could not pay. And knowing this servant could not pay the debt, the king ordered that that servant and the servant's family and everything he had be sold so the king could at least get something out of the debt, but the servant fell down at the king's feet. And the Bible says he worshipped the king. He was begging for mercy. And he asked the king, he said, just give me some more time, and I'll see if I can't make payment upon this debt. And the Bible says the king had compassion upon that servant. And he forgave the debt entirely. After being forgiven, this same servant went out. And he found another servant, and that servant that he found owed him a hundred pence. Now, 
a pence was about the equivalent of 16 cents today. So this servant who had been forgiven this huge debt goes out and finds somebody that owes him 16 bucks. And he demanded payment. And in fact, the Bible says he grabbed him by the throat and demanded payment. The second servant didn't have it to give to him and begged for time to pay. But rather than have compassion, that first servant had the one who owed him put into debtor's prison until the debt could be paid. Now, this wasn't done in the dark. It was done in the daylight. And people saw what happened, and people knew what had taken place previously. And so some of them went to the king, and they said, King, you remember that fellow you forgave the debt? Yeah. Well, here's what he just did. And the king was wrong. And the Bible says that the king called for that servant and had him delivered to the tormentors. And the word tormentors means torturers. Ending this parable, Jesus said to his apostles in the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verse 35, he said, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. <coughs> Jesus, as he was teaching his apostles how to pray, said in Matthew 6, 12, he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then in verse 15 of that same chapter, Jesus says, but if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And I got to wondering, why should we be so willing to forgive others? A lot of folks are like that commercial on TV Used to play Captain Spock, what was his name? Leonard, no, I, no, no, not Spock. The captain. Who? Yeah, the one who used to play Kirk, Captain Kirk. He's on commercials. You've probably seen the commercial. He gets on there and says, folks in West Virginia look at things a little differently. When somebody has wronged you, you need to make it more than right. Make it, get them back, worse than what they got you. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll find it. Why should we be so willing to forgive others? Well, think of what God has done or is willing to do for us. For example, we read in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. He says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Consider, what in the world could we possibly do on our own to make up for the sins which we have committed? Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Wages means the payment of sin. This is what sin brings us, death, separation from God. And if we have sinned, we are worthy of eternal separation from our Creator. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So all of us who are of the age of accountability and who are mentally capable have done things <laughs> which have earned us eternal separation from our God by ourselves, apart from the grace of God, we are all eternally doomed, but God's grace steps in. His grace steps in and makes it possible for our salvation. Not that we deserve it, but the love of God permits forgiveness. 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. The love of God makes it possible for us to have our debt of sin paid in full. This payment was made by the sinless Son of God on that cruel cross of Calvary. I want you to consider the message shared in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. There the Bible says that Christ made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, 
and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. <coughs> and the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then Paul says, of whom I am chief. <clears throat> Luke 19, 10, Jesus says to Zacchaeus, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Acts 20, verse 28, we find the Apostle Paul talking to the elders from Ephesus. And he says unto them in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1, the Bible says that we who are Christians have been... <coughs> adopted by God the Father, and all of this was made possible by Jesus. How could that be? Well, it's explained in verse 7, where we're able to read, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. First Peter 1 and verse 19 says, we're not redeemed or bought back to God by anything that is corruptible or worldly, but rather we are bought back with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. <coughs> so what have we learned from all these verses? We owe a debt we couldn't pay. <laughs> Not in our lifetime. Not in the time of the world could we pay the debt that we owe. God loves us, though. Even though we've sinned, and God sent his son to die on the cross to shed that precious blood to suffer that which we deserve. And as a result of Christ and the cross, we can have our debt paid in full. <coughs> John said in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, he speaks of Christ. And he says that Christ is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word propitiation is the Greek word helosmos. Helosmos. It means to satisfy a debt. To pay in full. The blood of Jesus can pay our debt in full. Take advantage of this. Take advantage of it now. Get your debt paid. Get the debt paid in full. Don't ignore the opportunity. The invitation's yours. If you're not a child of God, if you're not a Christian, make this the day that you leave the building with the slate wiped clean and marked paid in full by the blood of the precious Son of God. The opportunity is yours. Won't you respond? Won't you come while we stand and sing?